So living with a deep brain stimulator. Um, just first of all, the disclosures, like the stock market thing when you're a public company. Uh, this conversation should not be taken as medical advice. We are not doctors. Um, sometimes we think we are, but we pretend we are, but we're not. Um, this conversation is not sponsored or supported by any of the discussed neurotechnology companies. And Parkathon is hosting this event because we want to engage with the neurotech community. And without further ado, I'm going to like to turn it over to Mark and let him run with it and tell us his story. And then following that, we'll hear from Professor Madeline Lowry from the University of College of Dublin, who's an expert in DBS, can tell us all about it. And then we'll have a panel discussion with Mark, Madeline, and also our special guest, Heather, and, and the rest of you. It's a community conversation, so all ready to go, Mark? What I'd like to do is, first of all, um, tell you a little bit about me, who I am. My wife's a medical doctor, and she says that we're going to talk about a case report to do patient history. So I'll start with my, a little bit about who I am, and then I'll get talking about that DBS, a little bit about um, what I think DBS is. Madeline can tell us up more after that. And then also um, what I did with my own particular story with uh, having DBS and getting the settings right. Next slide. Okay, so from first 50 years and 60 seconds or less, um, I was, that's me, I was born and brought up in Belfast. That's me when I was about two. Belfast is an interesting place at that time. That's the street next to where I was when I was about two. It wasn't great. I uh, moved to Australia when I was uh, 25. Got married, got married to Sybil. Um, it was gorgeous girl I've ever met. And then I became a dad, it's baby Finn. Became a dad again. Baby Tara, and it was 2010. I got diagnosed with Parkinson's, and um, what it was, uh, the thing that really gave it up was um, I'd been a hands-on dad with Finn, changing nappies, bath, and babies. And when Tara was born three and a half years later, I couldn't do that. I couldn't even bath her. I just couldn't hold her. A little wriggly baby was too much to cope with, and that was um, that was really the trigger that what we go. Let me say there's something not quite right here. Diagnosed with Parkinson's and also three aneurysms. Got the aneurysms treated, and uh, that's the photo there, 2011. That was the photo before I was went into the hospital to have the aneurysms treated. Thankfully, made it through that. And then by about 2019, the um, the medication for Parkinson's wasn't really supporting the uh, symptoms of Parkinson's any longer, and so I chose to have DBS. So what is DBS? Well. No one had really told me beforehand. Um, it's very much the case that DBS, people talk about the patient selection and the expectation management and, and the, um, the surgery. But of course, after you do all that, after you've had the surgery, the DBS implants are in, then it's a case of actually choosing the right settings for um, the DBS system that you've got. And that's where it gets a bit complicated because it's very difficult to do that, apparently. And I had really not thought about that beforehand. I thought you had the surgery, as long as the surgery goes well, then you just switch it on. Um, but so just to come back for a second, what DBS is, that's a picture of my skull in the center of the screen. And the DBS electrodes are placed, oh, seven, eight, nine centimeters within down the brain. They don't call it deep brain stimulation for no reason. So that's what it is there. And what they're really doing is they're implanting an electrode um, and the one I've got has got uh, multiple segments, sort of depicted on this cartoon on the right here, the schematic. And you have about 16 electrode segments in my system. You can see eight on each side, one at the tip, one at the top, and then there's three in the middle tiers. And so what DBS is doing is they're setting how um, the, you know, the current, the pulse width, and the frequency. And what that means, if you can think about a light, I think about it anyway. If you think about a light with a dimmer switch, you can choose how bright you make the light bulb. And that's a bit like the current strength. The pulse width is how long you leave the pulse on for. So if you switch the light on, you leave it on for a moment, then you switch it off again. That length of time is what the pulse width is. And the frequency is how quickly you do that. How many times do you switch the pulse on and switch it off per second? And that's really what it is. It's, um, it's just those are the three settings, how, st how strong the pulse should be, how long you leave it on for, and how quickly you turn it on and off. 
And you can do that on whichever electrode segments they choose. And so the idea is you can actually send the electric uh, pulse in different directions into the brain with different settings. And what the device is often set to do, it's about 100 pulses per second, each pulse a few milliamps, and each pulse lasts only about 100 microseconds. So it's just a fraction of a second, a small pulse, maybe 100 times a second. Okay, so, so like I said, that's my very, very quick understanding of what DBS is. Um, Madeline will cover that much more detail in a moment. But what I wanted to try to show is what, um, what impact the different settings can have. So it's not a case of you have the surgery and they switch the DBS system on. If they don't have the right settings, it's a disaster. If they do have the right settings, it can work very, very well. So what I want to show here is a couple of um, a couple of videos. It's me in the park trying to play soccer. Uh, and these two videos are taken about two days apart. So there's very little time between them. Uh, and I'm on the same medication, the DBS system is working. The only difference is in the second video, one of the settings has been changed significantly. The frequency of the pulse has been decreased. Let's just look at the first one. This is me. And so just trying to move around in the park, take a ball, very, very hard. You can probably see freezing of gates, can't step at all. So hopefully that probably makes the point that, you know, it wasn't, uh, I'm not moving very well. If I go to the next slide, this is taken, like I say, less than to um, the 48 hours later. So the first pulse, the first video is on a Friday. A Friday afternoon, the second's on a Sunday morning. And this time in the park again, settings have been changed. And I hope you can see the difference. I mean, I'm able to move much better. I don't think Cristiano Ronaldo has anything to be worried about, but hopefully you can notice that I'm actually be able to move around okay. much better. Please. I'm trying to get you the, the That's best my view. Hey. Wife who's taking the video. I'm able to dribble past there. Oh. And then uh, what I like here, actually, it's um, a little dog runs across. So I have to stop with the little dog. And stopping is something that can be difficult to do, but to be able to stop without falling over when it was a, um, uh, without expecting it was a, a good thing to do. And like I say, so there you've got a case off. The only thing that's really changed is the settings dropping the frequency from 130 hertz down to 60 hertz, down to 60 pulses per second, and increasing the current a little bit as well. And that was the only difference. And I would say that the, what I've learned is that the frequency of um, DBS pulse, the impact of that on symptoms is not well understood. Okay. So running about in the park was one thing. It's a bit easier to do that. I'm walking down a hallway through a doorway. So these sort of things are very classic freezing the gate. Um, uh, uh, items that can encourage freezing the gate to come on. And so this is a picture of me at home trying to walk down the hallway. And again, I will show you, I'll show you the you know, one before and one after. So I've got this 60 hertz program, as you can see on the right. And that's the one that I was running about the park with. It was easy to run about outside. Just have a look at me trying to walk down the hallway. Stand up. And you can probably see it's the phrasing on the right hand side. But, um, so I can... Okay. So now all I've done differently is switch on the tip. So you can see as I've added this one tip electrode on the around the um, left STN, which will impact the right side walking. And this is about 15 minutes. So I switched on the tip, with about 15 minutes. And this is the uh, this is the impact. So again, I'd say, and hopefully you can see the difference. And like I say, if you've seen uh, videos of DBS before, it's not, um, this, this is not remarkable. The impact of DBS can be quite impressive, and especially for things like movement, obviously, it's all the things are speaking, 
uh, there's mood, there's a whole range of things, but then just the, the gross movement is easy to show in a video. And you can see sometimes it'd be quite dramatic. The point I'm trying to make is though it's not just switching on the DBS, it's finding these settings. And when I look at, if you look at this um, schematic on the, on the video screen at the bottom, the PowerPoint slide at the moment, you know, it's 60 hertz, 60 microseconds, and then current strength up in the mid tiers, 179 hertz, 60 microseconds, 2.8 milliamps, and with one tip. The problem is, Actually, there's hundreds of thousands of possible combinations. So how did we actually figure out that they were the right combinations for me? Because the combinations we used at the start, if you like the standard settings they often try, they just didn't work at all. So, so this is just um, a case of a little bit of trial and error. And I guess what I'm trying to get across here is I had to read up on my um, some medical case reports to try to figure out who had, had DBS, which was reported, that had symptoms similar to mine. And then I would suggest, make suggestions to my neurologist, a copy of my letter to my neurologist back in June 2020, where I suggested trial in 60 hertz, which was an unusual frequency to try. And then after doing that, um, what I've done, I've then spent a period of 11 days trying 19 different combinations of current um, to then see which is going to work best. And by the way, where it says about, you, know, you can see five milliamps and six milliamps, and then they're split equally across those two tiers. That's why it's about 2.2 .2 plus 2.3, 4.5 milliamps was the one we settled on. But to do that, to actually be at home over a period of 11 days, doing little experiments, timing myself, um, doing different tasks, videoing it, writing down some lots of notes, and then making different combinations of settings, trying it all again, is you know, non-trivial. And again, to get the um, to get the uh, freezing the gate addressed a bit better, what I've had to do is look. I suggested I gave my neurologist. Here's the copy of the letter. Um, it's a trial in the tip uh, electrode segment, and then he suggested using a high frequency, which I wasn't expecting to do at all. But it can be very very difficult to figure all these things out. And what I find is, you know, there's not enough effort going into programming. As the patient, I had to do these things because from what I could see. The medical team didn't have the time and didn't have the inclination to really spend the time working through to try to figure out what to do. If the standard settings work great, they don't, they don't really know what to do. They're not, you know, well, in Australia anyway, the medical system didn't seem to have the time to actually spend and work through all these details with me. So what do I suggest? And that's what motivated me to write my um, case report and all that published in brain stimulation. And hey, also Mark. Today. Yep. We have a question from the chat. Um, yep. Is what you're describing, does it only work for STN, deep brain stimulators, or different types as well? Look, I, I mean, my experience is with um, uh, deep brain stimulation in the S, that's the subthalamic nucleus. That's where the electrodes have been put. In my case, that's part of the brain. There's other targets in the brain you can use as well. But, um, but so, I would expect it to be the case no matter what you're doing in terms of target STN or other areas of the brain. Find, trying to find the right combinations of settings is difficult, I believe. My own experiences with them, with the STN. But well, this is my last slide. So I'll just whiz through this one quickly and I'm happy to take more questions. I guess if you're have, going to have DBS or you've got DBS, some of the suggestions I would make would be, you know, as when you see your neurologist, ask them to explain the DBS programming strategy they're going to use. When you go in to see your neurologist and they're going to want to make some changes to your DBS settings, then if you ask them, well, what, 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 how are you going to, what are they going to do? What strategy are they going to use to give you more therapeutic benefit from the, um, from the device, from changing your settings? And anything other than like, we don't really know, it'll be trial and error. And then I would say that um, perhaps they don't be, I'm not being quite honest, because really they don't know. We don't know enough about how DBS works, um, and certainly if you don't do, if you don't react well to the initial settings, they don't really know what to do next. I think um, make some notes to help you report back to your neurologist. What I found again is that they can change the settings, do some very basic tests, but then the impact of those setting changes doesn't kick in until three hours, six hours the next day, and so the neurologist then doesn't see you most of the time, and you're left their rooms obviously, and a day later you're really struggling. So what I'm trying to show here, a little graph I've used, where I just recorded the number of steps I was taking per day over a three month period, the mean number of steps plus or minus one standard deviation, then compare it, that was actually not for DBS changes, that was for medication change, 
and you could see that um, I put it to you that over that two, three month periods, you can see the real step up. So just things like that. So you can go back to your neurologist and report, yep, it definitely had this change, the settings of this change, my medication has really made a difference. And I'm doing that with some records is much easier than trying to do it from memory. Last two things, maintain a record of your TBS program settings. So when your neurologist leave, makes some changes, when you leave the clinic room, you don't actually know what the changes were. That's not good. They may have made a mistake. Um, you can't really have a record of what's been prescribed from a, from a DBS settings point of view. So take a photograph of your neurologist's laptop so you've got this record of what they've actually uh, set your DBS system to be on. And then the last thing, as I'd say, is when you're leaving DBS clinic, make sure that the program that was working really well when you entered the clinic is still available. And what I mean by that, often with DBS systems, you'll have a little patient programmer that lets you switch between two or three different programs per set by your neurologist. So if you walk in to see your neurologist and you're on program one, and that's working pretty well, they want to try to see if they can get it even better, make sure program one stays as it is, get to the change programs two, three, and four, something new to try. But a day later, if the programs that they've tried that, the, the, the new programs they've set for you do not work, do not work for you, maybe a day later it kicks in, you can't speak, you can't walk, you want to be able to switch back to the program that was working. So make sure that the program is working well for you when you enter your neurologist rooms, is, a, is again available for you when you leave. Happy to take questions on that. And now I are going to Madeline, who can obviously explain what DBS is much better than I can. But are there any other questions, Carly, at this point? I noticed Mark, uh, Heather had one in the channel about, or, uh, or a comment anyway. I don't know if you wanted to address that now, Heather, or when you have your spotlight moment in a moment. Are you speaking about the comment where I asked it was for globus pallidus infamous as well? Oh, that one. I missed that one. Or, or the other one about the... Um... Programming can be random because of medication uptake and drop-off stress of getting to appointment. Yeah. We've seen our MDs, something I can relate to. Yeah. Look, I, I just think, I just think so. Thanks. I think the whole, um, the whole uh, area is very difficult for, for the clinical, for the doctor and clinic, because, you know, you've got the medications, you've got the time of day, you've got the DPS settings, you've got the fact that, you know, you may be having a good moment or a bad moment, and they're trying to, they're trying to assess you in that context. And it's very, very difficult, obviously, for the doctor who's sitting looking at you to say, well, okay, this, you know, this change to this DBS settings have just made us having this impact as a long-term yeah. thing. It's really very difficult. There's just too much happening. And so really what I think you need is use both technology, but also listen to the patient rather than try to make the assessment in, a, um, in that 20 minute clinical appointment, make the assessment by saying to the patient, tell me about how you're going, use technology to measure things. Um, that's I think much, much better way of doing it. And I can see Gary and John. John, you got your hand up. Well, I was just going to ask, uh, Heather, are you talking about uh, the current steering capacity is, or are you talking about um, this stimulation of that lower part to try to get towards the PPN, which is sort of theoretical? Okay, well, I have the GPI, first of all. Mm -hmm. And when they program me since the start, it's never been quite right. Mm -hmm. They've never made the mark. My balance is off. I've fallen more in the last two years than I've fallen in my entire life. That includes when I was a roller roller derby girl so mm -hmm. go figure uh, i'm just adding to the fact that when we are getting programmed it might not make the mark or maybe it does while we're there in the office and then we leave and it's like the car that you take into your you know guy and it's making the ding ding sound and doesn't when you and then it starts again when you leave it doesn't <laughs> do it in front of them so who knows <laughs> programming stuff I'm, I'm amazed at mark mark that you could figure this out by yourself it's really genius that that's the that is the, to me the focus of this is how it managed to do it yourself. It's amazing. It, it gives it gives a lot more resolution. I, yes. I think the short answer is the GPI, the Glowus pallidus pars interna, is a, ter, a different target. It's actually the older target, and it's a much bigger area. But you still, if you're using Boston Scientific, I have the same capacity to do that kind of current steering. It's just a bigger target, takes more current, and I'm not going to get too deep into that because I know this is probably Dr. Lowry's real world. Um, so yes, it is doable, but it, it, it's more challenging. I think your comment about uh, timing, it's like I, it's another factor you have in it. We're taking the picture, like you were saying, Mark, but I also think um, trying to get your, your, your sessions at a time when, when it's 
similar to the last time, it seems like it would make sense to try to be as mm -hmm. consistent and cut as many variables as possible. Good luck finding that timing in, in their schedule. But you know, if you can try to do it. But but I, I do but I do think I mean one of the issues is not being able to see what your settings are. I think it's a real issue that you know if you if you the way I compare it is if you were imagine you're um given some medication by your doctor and the doctor says okay I want you to take these two blue tablets in the morning and the one red tablet in the afternoon. And you say, sorry, what are these medications? And they say, oh, you shouldn't want to know what they are. And that's quite literally the conversation I've had with DBS settings where I've asked what the settings were and been told by the Boston Scientific Rep, I shouldn't know, I shouldn't want to know what the settings are, which is just ridiculous. I mean, why would you not want to know that? It doesn't mean you need to have a chemistry degree or pharmacology background to actually you know, have, have want to know about your medication. You just want to know what the medication is. It's the same with DBS settings. They're sending these pulses to your brain and they're actually not, you're actually trying to keep it hidden what they are. From the patient point of view, you can't even see. The patient programmer doesn't let you see what the settings are. And I just find that a quite a bizarre thing. So even to check if the, if the neurologist made a mistake, I've had one occasion going to the neurologist. They made one change that they weren't supposed to make. And when I got home, I could see things weren't right. And um, they changed my program home, which is the good program. And but thankfully, we were able to check because I'd taken screenshots of the photos of the neurologist's laptop so we could actually see they made a mistake and back into the clinic and got it corrected that day but if you don't actually know what the settings are then how could you um how could you have done that so you should you should know what the as a patient you should have a right to know what the settings are and gary's got his hand up yeah gary, i was just really going to make a comment mark um it sounds a bit like um you know dbs isn't kind of thoroughly tested out in every kind of single um, setting that there could be before people come to your brain and stick something in it and then you kind of go play around with it afterwards. I mean, that's what you've done and we've talked about this before and I mean, you've hit on the, the frequency that suits you. I just get really worried when, when I hear things like your consultant saying, you shouldn't have to worry about that. Um, don't, don't, don't dabble in that, you know, just leave it to us kind of thing. Because it's very, it feels quite similar to some of the medication that I've taken sometimes, and it hasn't, I haven't reacted well to it. Somebody else reacts very well to it. We're all different. We're all on the same journey, but we're all different at the same time. And um, I kind of would like to have a bit more certainty if I was a, a candidate for DBS, that would be a, a two-way conversation afterwards about how it would, would be set up. And I would be fully in the loop and in the light of what's going on with my brain that's being controlled by, by a controller outside. So it's just really that comment. I mean, it's another thing we have to do living this life of Parkinson's. But anyway, there you go. Thanks, Gary. Now, look, I'm just conscious that Madeline can do a much better job than I could ever do of explaining what the <laughs> what DPS actually is. Um, so go on, but uh, probably just worth mentioning that for people who've just joined, obviously. So by the way, we are this is recorded. So just um, be aware that we're recording the Zoom event. And we normally post it on the um, on our YouTube channel afterwards. So for those who have just joined late, please be aware of that. Madeline, do you want to tell us all about DBS? Great. Th thanks very much, Mark. You're a hard hard act to follow. I'll share the screen here. Um, I'm an electronic engineer. Um, I'm in the School of Electrical and Electronic Engineering in UCD. And uh, I've been working in biomedical engineering since I started my PhD. And my interest is around control of a human control of movement or human motor control. So I'm interested in using engineering techniques to better understand how we control movement, how that changes, for example, with fatigue or as we age or in different types of neurodegenerative diseases, such as Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease, and then how we can develop technologies in order to correct that or interact with the nervous system in order to restore function. And that's where my interest in, in deep brain stimulation comes in. So, so Mark asked me if I could say something about how DBS works. Um, and I'm coming at it from an engineering point of view. So for the last uh, about 15 years or so, I've been working on deep brain stimulation. So before that, we were working on electrical stimulation of muscle, um, which has been around for, for decades. It's been around since the, you know, the 1960s um, and is fairly well understood. And deep brain stimulation then in the early 2000s emerged as a new treatment for Parkinson's disease and a range of other, as you, as you well know, range of other um. Uh, neurological conditions but there's a lot of commonality between it as well so in the slides I have here what I've tried to do is tease out a little bit about what we do understand about it and then where the gaps in knowledge are and um, because there is a lot of 
you know, the mechanisms of, of, of DPS uh, are poorly understood. But at the same time, there is quite a lot uh, that we do understand. And that's where I'll start. So some of it is probably stuff that you're very familiar with already. But um, and as Mark mentioned, uh, the stimulators implanted within the deep structures of the brain for Parkinson's disease. And um, as we heard already, those structures are either the STN, subthalamic nucleus, the GPI, the globus pallidus internus, or occasionally the PPN was explored as well, less so now, but it was explored as an alternative target, particularly for people with freezing of gait, because as Mark mentioned, the STN and GPI weren't good for freezing of gait. Um, and those electrodes that are connected by means of leads, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but there's leads that tunnel down at the back of the neck and then they're, they connect to um, an implanted pulse generator, which is just like you have for uh, pacemakers, and that's implanted just in, in the skin, just above the um, uh, just above the chest there. And that contains all of the electronics and it contains the battery and it sends the pulses up. And as we Mark talked about earlier, um, there's different settings you can have on it. And the three big settings are the, or actually there's four probably. First one is which electrodes, which contacts on your electrode uh, are stimulated. Then the you can vary the amplitude of the pulse that's delivered, the pulse duration and the frequency. And we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, in terms of the efficacy, as you saw from the videos there that Mark had, it's, it's very, very effective. So I've just pulled a few studies here. The types of improvements you're seeing um, in standard clinical scores can be of the order of 65, 70 percent. So it's really a very dramatic improvement that's reported. And, um, you know, people say that it, it can be it is life changing. When you talk to people with DBS, they'll say that it has, you know, it, it really has a very significant impact on people's lives. The, there are challenges with it as well. So parameter setting is very, very tricky. It's set really by means of trial and error. I was pulled up once by a neurologist for saying that, and he was saying that they're very highly skilled, which of course people are. But essentially, it's by testing it and seeing how, you know, seeing how those different parameters work. Studies show that it can take up to about six months to, to get right. Um, about studies have also shown and reported that in about 40% of people with suboptimal DBS, where it wasn't working very well, that that improved with um, reprogramming. So that's a big number. Um, the battery life with the, the old conventional batteries is about three to four years. They need to be replaced then. The new rechargeable batteries, they say, last about somewhere between 15 and 25 years for the Boston Scientific ones. Um, but there are also side effects associated with it as well. And that's largely due to stimulation of regions outside the region of interest. So if, it's, if the uh, stimulation spreads to other paths coming down, then you can inadvertently stimulate areas associated with mood, with sleep, with speech and so on. And that can lead to side effects. Um, how oh, there's I, I have another slide there in the efficacy, but it's just really to show that across a range of studies, the dark is the baseline, and you can see in the lighter one at six to twelve months and even five years, you get a sustained improvement um, with DBS. How does it work? So if we go back to first year electronic circuits, in one way it's very simple. So we're all familiar with the idea of a battery. You can connect a battery then through some sort of a very simple circuit here with a light bulb. If you apply a voltage or a current there at that battery, the current flows through your circuit and the light bulb lights up. And in a very similar way, what we're doing with DBS is there's a battery that applies a current or a voltage to the tissue in the brain. And if that current then is applied to or passes a nerve, if it's sufficiently strong, uh, it'll cause that, cause that nerve to fire. We say or it's activated. So it'll generate a little impulse and it's activated. It lights up if you like, like the light bulb. Um, and nerves are activated by means of very small currents and voltages. So you can see here, these are these action potentials that we say that are generated every time a nerve fires. And when you change the pulse amplitude or duration, you're changing, you're deciding whether or not it fires. And then when you change the frequency of your DBS signal, you're changing when it fires. So at a simple level, the nerve will fire and um, almost every time the DBS signal is, uh, is activated, every time one of those pulses comes in. Now, on top of that, it can also, these pulses here can also stop it firing, inhibit it as well. But um, we can think of it in those simple terms initially. Am I stuck? Oh, yeah. Uh, just looking at the, maybe the electrodes and the leads again, first of all, these are the, the original leads that were developed by Medtronic, which has got four contacts on them. They're platinum iridium contacts, and then they have an insulating, insulating lead that goes down to the, the pulse generator. Um, now, as we heard earlier, there's multi-electrode arrays that are available. And essentially what they do is they increase the number of uh, contact points that can be used. 
and they also segment them. So it's like chopping them like a cake, if you like, around and you can pick different segments of that slice uh, at which to apply your current. And that allows you the ability then to steer the current in different directions. Um, when we talk about DBS as well, you can determine, you know, which electrodes you're placing that current or voltage at. The very simplest configuration is a simple monopolar configuration. And this is just a computer simulations here that show you what the voltage is around the electrode. So in this one here on our far left, we're applying a, a voltage here at this particular point or a current. Um, and you can see then that it spreads out and then decays as you move away from your electrode. If you use bipolar stimulation, you're applying an equal um, but opposite in sign current at two different points here. And you can see that it gives you a slightly different distribution of that voltage in the surrounding tissue. So that will affect which neurons are activated there. Uh, and it also tends to bring the activation in a little bit. It makes it tighter. And you can extend that further going to a tripole stimulation where you'd have, let's say, maybe one volt applied here, half a volt at this electrode, half a volt at this electrode, and it changes it again. And then with these fancy electrode arrays that we saw a minute ago, it gets even more complex again. You can get into much more um, sophisticated configurations with that. So if we look maybe at the pulse amplitude, duration, and frequency, first of all, and see what they do. So this is what the stimulus waveform looks like. We can see the frequency determines how often um, it stimulates it. So we talk about frequency in hertz. That just means the number of pulses per second. So 100 hertz or 130 hertz means 100 pulses per second or 130 pulses per second. And then if we look at those pulses, they're very, very short. For DBS, for Parkinson's, they're only about 60 microseconds in, in duration. So it's very, very short. Um, and that can be varied. So uh, you can, for Parkinson's disease, maybe it goes between about 60 microseconds up to about um, maybe 100 microseconds or so. Um, the amplitude can also be varied here. And then uh, that can be applied either as a voltage in the older stimulators and the newer stimulators now, including the Boston Scientific ones, typically you would apply it just as a current. Um, you'll see there's a second pulse here as well, and that's a charge balancing pulse. So this first pulse is the one that stimulates the nerve, and the second charge balancing pulse doesn't affect the neuron really. But what it does is if we were to look at the area under that pulse, it's the same uh, in the stimulating one as the charge balancing one. So it means that what you do is you're putting in the same amount of positive current as negative current, and it means that there's no net accumulation of charge. So it ensures there's no damage to the tissue. So that's what that second charge balancing pulse does. Um, and the other important thing about the pulses uh, is to know whether they're delivered as a positive pulse or negative pulse, and both work. So typically for DBS, I've drawn it here like a positive pulse. So that's called um, anodal stimulation when the pulse is positive, but you could just flip it upside down. So you're getting a negative pulse um, and that's cathodal stimulation and that's generally more effective. So that's normally the one that's used first of all. Um, so it's actually a negative pulse that stimulates. Um, and what's the relationship then between pulse amplitude and duration? So the pulse amplitude and duration are very tightly coupled uh, if we're trying to understand how a nerve is stimulated. And that's this is well understood going back uh, many decades. This curve here is a characteristic curve here that shows, how, shows what the minimum current is in order to activate a nerve for a given pulse duration. So what we, can, what we get from this is that the wider the pulse duration, so the longer the pulse duration here, the, the lower the amplitude that you need in order to activate a particular nerve or neuron. If you make the duration narrower, then you need a higher amplitude in order to activate it. So there's a sort of a trade-off between pulse amplitude and duration. Um, and that threshold at which you'll stimulate the nerve as well also depends on how far the nerve is from the electrode. And it also depends on the properties of that nerve. So it depends on the type of nerve it is, what its diameter is, uh, you know, what the specific makeup or ion channels that are in that nerve are as well. So it's the pulse amplitude and pulse duration really that determine what the region of tissue around the electrode that's activated is. Um, and that can be predicted using computer models. So that's some of the work that we do is looking at that. You'd predict what the voltage around the electrode is. You can see it sort of here. You can then um, embed neurons into the model as well. And you can use that to predict what the volume of tissue activated is. And Boston Scientific do a version of that as well. And Medtronic do now in the software that they provide to the clinicians. So from that, you can predict for a given set of um, stimulation parameters, and it's really pulse amplitude and duration, you can predict what region of tissue around the electrode is activated. 
shown here in this example where there is an applied current and an applied voltage. And it's typically with DBS, it reaches out to about, depending on the parameters, but it's about um, maybe, you know, one to two millimeters and uh, the, the volume of tissue activated would be outside it. Now that volume of tissue activated is a very simplified construct as well, because the way it's the way it's uh, come up with is assuming you have all identical neurons running nice and parallel uh, to one another. And then they essentially assume that it's the same when you run it around the electrode, when you spin it around it. So it is very simple, but it gives a, a ballpark approximation of how far that stimulation is affecting the tissue around it. Um, and that's where current steering comes in again. So in that example I had a minute ago, it was like a ball around the electrode that stimulated it, or that was stimulated. And that's this is the figure from the paper uh, that was that was um, circulated for the book club today. So this you see here with these, uh, this is the example you see on the left-hand side with the Medtronic stimulator, where you have that ball and it's showing it for different amplitudes um, of current or for different pulse durations. You can see, you can vary how big that ball is. And then the directional leads that you see on the Boston Scientific, um, and Boston Scientific electrode on the right, you can see that you can just activate one side of the electrode. So it allows you then to steer that current or that shape. It, so it's no longer a ball, it's more of a, um, you know, like a fan shape spreading out from it. So that's giving an ability to direct it away from regions you want to avoid and target regions you want to. And Medtronic have directional leads available now as well, right, as I understand. Okay, so that's in some ways the easier part. The more complex part, like Mark um, alluded to earlier, is around the network effect of DBS and the effect of frequency. So DBS affects not just individual neurons, but it's clear that it's a network effect and it affects networks of neurons within the brain. So if we look where it's located, we spoke earlier about the subthalamic nucleus and the STN, uh, and of the DBS electrode is implanted here and it affects maybe neurons to about two millimeters around that. But that STN is part of a very big network uh, within the brain that is responsible for the control of movement. And it's clear that when you stimulate the neurons here, you're not just affecting their behavior, but you're affecting through all these connections that can be either excitatory, they can excite each other, or they can inhibit or dampen down the behavior of each other. It affects behavior throughout that network. And it's in that way that it has that ability to affect um, the behavior of these networks of neurons and through that to impact motor function and movement. Um, and one important sort of finding that's come out over the last maybe 15 years or so is the interaction between deep brain stimulation and uh, pathological or unwanted oscillatory activity within the brain, and in particular, uh, beta band activity. So it's known now for some time that in Parkinson's disease, you get an increase in activity, oscill oscillatory activity, so like oscillations within a particular frequency range. Um, within what's known as the beta frequency range. So that's oscillations that are about 15 to 30 Hertz. So that means that you get, if you look at the, the population activity within the different regions of the SDN, the cortex and the, the uh, basal ganglia, you'll get um, strong kind of synchronized activity that's going in kind of waves about 15 times per second or 20 times per second within that frequency band. And when DBS is turned on, DBS suppresses these oscillations. Um, so you can see an example here. This is a, a recordings, local field potential recordings made at the DBS electrode. Um, and you can see when DBS is off here, this strong band here just indicates those unwanted oscillations like I was talking about. When DBS is turned on, it disappears. Um, and sorry, the dog is outside the, the, out the room there. Hope you can't hear him. Um, so those oscillations are suppressed. And what's interesting is that the suppression of those beta band oscillations is correlated with motor improvement as well. And it's now known as well that, um, that these beta band oscillations are also suppressed with levodopa. Um, and that brings us a little bit into uh, to the variation, the effect of frequency. So when we, one thing we do know is that DBS only works at higher frequencies. And um, so conventionally it's thought that it works at frequencies above about 100 Hertz. But now, as, as Mark was explaining earlier, there is interest now in looking at lower frequencies in and around 60 hertz. But they're still probably relatively high uh, for neural activity. Um, so this just shows an example. This is a modeling study, but it just shows the strength of those oscillations um, when DBS is off and at different frequencies of DBS. And you can see on the right, you know, how effectively they're suppressed when you have DBS over about 100 hertz. Um, and that brings us in then to looking at sort of future applications of DBS. 
So, and one area that we're particularly interested in is closed loop control of DBS. Um, and that was discussed in the, the paper we had. I'm happy to talk about it. So this is a direction that there's a lot of interest in at the moment. Um, because there's so many different combinations of parameters and because um, each individual's needs will vary over the day and over time, ideally what you like is a really smart system that could record from the brain and then could automatically adjust the stimulation parameters. And that's the idea behind closed loop control or adaptive DBS. So the idea is it could record electrical activity from the brain, interpret that, and then use that to automatically adjust the stimulation parameters. And there is progress being made on that at the moment. Um, this is an example, again, from some modeling studies that just shows, I suppose if you just look at maybe the band in the middle on both of these, it's just showing how different controllers can automatically adjust the stimulation parameters in order to tune it and suppress those, those oscillations that we want to, to, to suppress. Um, so just lastly, maybe to, um, to sum up a little bit, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, well, a few things in terms of what we understand. DBS stimulates nerves lying close to the electrode. So very importantly, it can also inhibit or quieten them. Um, the nerves closest to the electrode will be the easiest to stimulate. So the type of nerve also affects this. So that also influences it. I was just saying the nerves closest to the electrode are the easiest ones to stimulate. Um, but it, it's very important, the actual type of nerve um, also affects this. And what's, there's a lot of interest in at the moment is that it seems that the, when the nerves connect into the STN, they have these little branches called collaterals that branch into it. And it seems like it's those little collaterals that are the first um, parts of the nerve that are activated before the axons. Um, the stimulus pulse and amplitude determine, sorry, I have a typo in there, it should be the pulse amplitude and duration, I'll correct that, determine whether a nerve will be stimulated. So the pulse amplitude and the duration really determine whether it's stimulated. The frequency is almost independent of that, though you can get sort of a recovery phase depending on the, uh, the frequency of stimulation. And the frequency determines the pattern of activation of the nerves. Um, it's clear now that there's excessive pathological neural oscillations that uh, within the brain in Parkinson's disease, these are associated with bradykinesia and rigidity um, for the beta band oscillations. There's also oscillations at a much lower frequency that's associated with Parkinsonian tremor, and these are suppressed by DBS. Now, whether that's causal, whether there's actually a, a sort of a causal relationship there or whether it's correlative, whether they just happen to occur at the same time due to some other processes is not clear. So that, that is important to keep in mind. Uh, the new electrode arrays that are emerging allow the DBS signal to be directed towards the target nerves and away from those that cause side effects. So that's a, a great advance, but the, the challenge there is trying to understand it and come up with intelligent ways and smart ways to be able to control them. Um, and then there's also a move towards closed loop or adaptive DBS systems um, that can both sense and stimulate. And the idea there is that they would allow, you know, sort of to put behind, you know, different techniques such as control theory and machine learning and so on in order to be able to to cope with that challenge of having so many parameters and what, finding the best ones for any individual person. Um, and smart, smart closed loop adaptive strategies are promising at the moment to allow sort of simultaneous control of symptoms, side effects and, and power consumption. So thanks very much. Okay. All right, thank you very much, Madeline. That was very insightful. I think I finally are I'm starting to understand it. I had one quick question. I just, you know, I've heard that this the DBS is kind of like a pacemaker for the brain. Yeah. But the analogy is if we don't do the closed loop DBS, it's more like or have more control of our settings. It's like having a heart that beats 60 beats per second, whether we're you know, sleeping or climbing Mount Everest. Is that something you could comment on? Yeah, it, it is. At the first pass, it's like a pacemaker for the brain, but actually the brain is much more complex because the heart is easy. All you have to do with the heart and the pacemaker is you just make it, it you stimulate the heartbeats right. and it does what it's meant to do. So the heart is a really simple pump. That's all it does. And the challenge with DBS for Parkinson's disease is doing the same thing and that you're applying a stimulus and it's causing neurons to fire in the same way. But the difficulty is we don't yet fully understand how the brain controls movement. We don't understand what the patterns of neural activity are and how they change. So you're trying to um, 
I suppose you're trying to uh, adjust or to control something that itself is not yet fully understood. And that's where the challenge really is with it. Yeah. Mm. We have several questions in the chat. Also, do we have some hands raised? I would actually, see John's got his hand raised. Oh, did anyone else have it? I thought of it. Anybody else? Just because her experience is so different, I, I kind of want to hear Heather's voice before we get into the conversation. Because, Mark, you are you are the uh, one in a million uh, perfect outcome. I won't say perfect outcome because you got there. It wasn't like you came out. I think Ben Stetcher had a very amazing outcome. It sounds like you got there, but he Heather's been on the other side of it. Yeah, I, I've broken my tailbone. I landed on my hip just yesterday trying to do some things. I never fell before DBS. I was told by the head of the surgery where I go to where I had it done to just turn it off. That was his answer to me, and I saw him the other day, and he's just there's nothing yeah. further. Just hundred thousand dollars operation. A million. A million dollars and they had a whole team of people surrounding me lifting me promoting this when it was started i'm not saying it, it was the wrong choice by the way but at, to date they have not been able to program me correctly and these are the experts in their field they're the ones that everybody sends everyone to that's the irony here and um i was very careful in choosing i read everything i could the reason why they chose gpi for me instead of stn though and i have a feeling that's why this didn't work so well is simply because I was experiencing freezing and a lot of dystonia and not much dyskinesia and not much shaking at all. So the dystonia, it does help with the dystonia because when I followed this surgeon's advice and just turned it off, which I thought was hilarious. Thanks doc. Um, I did get the crippling twisting muscle contractions come back ferociously. And so that, and so since it's common, yes, for dystonia, it did, it does help. However, I could turn it off right now and I wouldn't necessarily experiencing that tw that twisting for the first day that I had it off. And I could speak a lot clearer, although I'm right clear right now because I'm on my meds perfectly um, without the manic. <laughs> and I'm still entirely de um, reliant on my medication though. I just wanted to add that in for the STN people, you can you know, titrate off your meds a bit, which is a huge thing as we know. <laughs> And also, I believe, and maybe Dr. Lowry, Madeline, you could probably tell me, yeah. is the is the GPI slightly removed from the uh, speech center so that you have less chance of losing your speech? Is that correct? My understanding it is, but I need to I need to double check there. But yeah, I'm pretty, pretty sure that's what they told me. Yeah, yeah. the losing right above uh, the descending cortical bulbar fibers that innervate. So it's the cranial nerves that affect speech that get impacted. And the STN is kind of right above those. That's why STN does have more impact. Another yeah. issue with the STN is that you can get some stimulation that can affect the internal capsule. It'll yeah. lead beyond the internal capsule and I'll lead some polling and that sometimes affects speech as well. Yeah. It's interesting if they change programs too often, it's another whole mess. But if they change programs once in a while, while I'm in the office, I always leave and it kind of works really well. But then a few days later, it drops yeah. off again. So it's a mystery to me. And Mark, you blew my mind. I call, I had a conversation with Mark. He's like, I fixed it myself. I'm like, you did what? It sounds to me like three aliens are going upstairs to the moon on a Saturday. How long will it take them to get to Ohio if they have a pancake for someone there? Like, I don't even know. It's not even, it's worse than algebra. <laughs> Like I don't know. Well, Heather, you've been, Heather, you've been a, bit, a bit too kind, but what what I all I really did was read medical journals to find out, you know, find case report for people who reported, okay, and with the person with these symptoms, these are the settings that worked. And now I don't try to explain, I'm trying to uh, give the impression I really understand the EPS, but I just if you work through the medical literature, I knew my symptoms better than anyone else because it's my symptoms. I was able to document what I was feeling, problems I was having, find examples where people with those symptoms had tried different settings and then said to my doctor, okay, this should we try this? But um, so I didn't really understand DBS. I just understood that, okay, in this example, here's an example of some case reports from work, right. work, work for that person and they had similar symptoms. But I, but just to say, 
I mean, things like we're talking about speech, when I had the post DBS, well, that's right, before DBS, I could sometimes struggle to finish one sentence. And I don't mean that um, people couldn't understand me. I mean, I couldn't, I would get halfway through a sentence and I couldn't think of the words I wanted to say next Asia. and I wasn't able to express them. So I mean, and then after DBS, it was even worse. <laughs> so after DBS, I could be sitting next to my wife on the couch and literally she couldn't understand the word I was saying. Right. And now I put to you that, well, okay, my speech sometimes drops off. It's not perfect, but I hope to, I mean, I'm very keep, clear. <laughs> I think it's reasonable. Actually, sometimes the thing is, it's actually post DBS with the right settings. What's happened is I actually speak faster again because back in Ireland, that's what we do. We start speaking a million miles a minute and people can't get a word in address. The thing is, that's how it was. And so some, some speech, of, um, some doctors are like, no. Mark, you're more difficult to understand. And I'm thinking, yes, that's the way it should be. With an Irish accent, speaking the way I was brought up to speak, I can be difficult to understand. Right. That's not the issue. Sometimes when I speak more slowly, I could be up. But the volume, they, they just weren't really measuring it. So um, I had a speech pathologist who I engaged with to actually really carefully measure my speech. And he noted the increase in the number of syllables per second as he measured it. But that was, that was me getting back to how I was. So, it's, but the speech just is not well understood. The impact on speech doesn't seem to be well understood at all, to be honest. It reminds me. It was a frequency change. It reminds me of the labyrinth in The Shining. The, the thought comes out just as quick as ever. The people are just as quick as ever. They have this, but there's a whole labyrinth that it needs to go through, like a snowy labyrinth before it actually comes out of the mouth. Um, so that's why I was hired for these radio shows, you know, with, with, with the Mike and Mike show, because they were both losing their speech. They needed somebody mouthy and bossy to come in mm -hmm. and talk a lot. But John did ask a question here. Anyone to help troubleshoot? I work with my programmer to troubleshoot and they've switched programmers several times. They've also switched people that were on my team several times. Some of whom, like if you were to open my, my chart, it would look like I have a million people helping me. That's not true. The person who helps me the most is actually the rep from uh, Boston Scientific. And it's not that they're not trying. That would have been my first recommendation. It's like, does Boston Scientific have a troubleshooter? Like, I know they have Sierra Ferris over there, but that's not okay. Yeah, I, I you, you, Mark, whenever you're ready to open your consultancy, we're, we're here to talk to you. Okay. I, I don't think I'll give up my day job on him soon. I can see Jason's got his hand up. Yeah, I had a quick question for Madeline. So the closed loop system, I mean, sounds perfect because you're getting yeah. that feedback. But then you, we know there's a delay, and Heather outlined that as well. Yes. Up to a day. So there's only a closed loop system incorporating a day or more to, you know, make sure you're setting it right. Seems really difficult to do. Is that worked on as well? It's so it's a really good question. At the moment, it's not, but there's an awareness of it, I suppose. Now, in principle, from a control theory point of view, if you're looking at it as an engineering system or something like that, there are ways to do that. But it is challenging, you know, it means you're, you're just one way would be that I think that you could have something like nested controllers. So the control systems, the, the closed loop systems they're looking at at the moment that are being explored um, are responding immediately, really. Um, or they're, you know, they're either they're closing, they're shutting down maybe those beta oscillations, for example, or they're looking at tremor. And when it gets big, potentially, then it's, you know, increasing the stimulation and dropping it down again. But you could have another um, sort of another loop on top of that that could be looking at other symptoms for example speech or something like that um, and could be adjusting the stimulation parameters then in response to those on a much slower time course it's a, it is a very challenging problem it's like the next that'll be sort of the next stage again but it should it, you know it should in principle open the possibility to do things like that and maybe I, I put down notes from earlier when when people were chatting just about, um, you know, Mark was suggesting about being able to get quantitative measures like your step count or, uh, you know, whatever it is, maybe from wearables. They could possibly offer the potential for that as well or coming back to your clinician, you know, if you can quantify things like that or quantify speech parameters and how they change. We can analyze those like signals as well and pull out differences in them. But you could yeah, change. more data, the better, if possible. That's right. Yeah, if, if you can understand it. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Great, thank you. Great. Thanks. John, I can see um, a number of um, questions in the chat. I'm not sure if anyone's able to pick out some of there to first answer. 
Okay, I think we've got a lot of these coming through. We've been answering them as we go along in chat, but um, let me go through until we can find something here if there's anything to add. In the meantime, having a look, I was going to just ask Madeline with the with the closed loop systems, you're talking about varying the parameters to re in response to you know, various uh, signals being measured in the brain, various biomarkers. But is it right to say all you're really doing is changing the amplitude? I mean, you're not changing the electrode configuration or the frequency of the pulse width, you're increasing the, uh, the pulse strength. So you that's still have Yeah, that's so the challenge, have... Mark. Yeah, yeah, that's the challenge. So in what's been looked at at the moment, what has been trialed in patients just over very short periods of time, um, we've done a small study in animals and then there's been a lot done on um, the computer modeling as well. It's all just changing the amplitude. But really, the challenge is to be able to change all the parameters so that you're looking at instead of just changing one parameter at a time, you're looking simultaneously at amplitude, frequency and pulse duration, and then also at electrode configuration as well. So it's a very challenging um, problem, but that's the I, I mean, that's the advantage, I suppose, of using automated systems like that. that potentially, they could do that in a way we just can't, you know, can't do, you know, manually. Yeah. Mm. And see, th th does say thanks, Heather, for um, showing us the um, the battery pack. Yeah, so that's it. That's the impulse generator. They used to be a lot bigger than I remember, but um, but that's what this. This is the one smallest the one ones. they said was available because I'm so thin. Yeah. They didn't want it yeah. to stick out like a third boob. <laughs> I even asked, "Can you put it behind my boob?" He's like, "That wouldn't be a very good idea." Yeah. Just hide well, it. it you know? You've got the same system I do, isn't it? The Boston Scientific. Um, it doesn't get in the way. I, I barely know it's there unless someone hugs you really tightly. You don't even know it's there. It doesn't. I'm not the same mind as you. any trouble. Can, can I ask Heather a question? Um, Heather, has your sense of humor gotten worse or better since the, the whole DVS thing? Well, it's either laugh or cry. So, you know, <laughs> what I <laughs> often say in the, in the, you know what I love to do when I'm in the wheelchair in the airport? With little kids because you know you're right on their level right so i just go psst, psst, i'm a robot huh? and then i do this and then when their parents look over i'm like <laughs> and so they're like bye robot you know everybody i have i have the kids on it like so it's really fun and then i, I get up on the chair like this and i, I walk it. to the plane <laughs> that's really i knew it Heather. i knew it you've got to amuse ourselves Oh, you sure do. Yeah, absolutely. If you can't have a laugh at this, sometimes you, you just it's it's just going to wreck your head. So there is a question about uh, amplitude, right? It, it, it's almost asking that you're saying when your battery amplitude goes up, your speech goes down. Are you asking me? Uh, uh, no, no, it's my question. Um, I don't know if the right word is amp amplitude, amplitude, the, um, um, whatever measure goes up and goes down, that the, whatever goes up goes, also goes down. So, I mean, what, what I've found is certainly, um, you've got different sweet spots. So with some of the settings I've been on, um, the higher for the 130 Hertz, I can recall that as they put the amplitude up, um, my walking would get a bit better, but my speech would get worse. And so there's a real trade off there. But that was a certain, you know, that was with another set of frequencies and pulse width settings and electrode segments. But yes, you could have it where you start to get more and more stimulation around that particular with that conf particular configuration, helping my walking but making my speech worse. And what I found is there was a real trade off between speech and walking for most for most settings. But on the 60 hertz setting that I'm using um, in, the, in the main STN plus the 179 hertz in the tip. That doesn't seem to be the problem. But um, so my speech, it's not great, but it's okay. It's a lot better than it used to be. And uh, my walking's fine as well. But you have different combinations to set it, get to different trade offs. And I've heard that before. I think I saw something in the chat where sometimes people have one program settings for when they're trying to do like move around and sport and walking, another program settings for when they're trying to talk. But I think really that's, um, and that's one thing you can do to switch between two programs. And you, Hit in the park, going for a run, have one program on, and you're sitting at a desk talking, have a different program. I'm not no. quite sure how really sustainable that is long term. I haven't done that, but that's something I've heard people do. And I see Miguel has his hand up. Miguel, did you have a question? 
Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know how important my questions are. I'm curious. I haven't had DBS yet. I'm still in the process of uh, being evaluated. Um, I'm curious what the battery is made out of. Is it lithium ion? Is it? Uh, it is. And then uh, with the increases of uh, frequency or duration or amplitude and such, does that heat the pulse generator up? Does it get warm, or are these just too small of amounts to affect the battery? They're too. They don't. Re they don't heat up. No, they yeah. they won't. They're too small. Yeah. There there have been some studies showing just around the electrode itself, tiny you know changes to see there if this changes in temperature. They're negligible. Yeah. What about temperature? <laughs> Uh, if you're in a hot tub or under, you know, it's cold outside in the, you know, that doesn't, you're, you're I don't think so. I doubt it. Yeah. But I'm just, I'm going just intuitively the body has such a good control system itself. It regulates itself. So it's a very stable environment like that. So I don't know of anything. I haven't come across anything like that. On... Strong the, thing to, the thing to watch out, so just the thing to watch out for is when you're recharging and you've got your um, recharger over the um, unpulse mm. generator. Say they say don't don't do it when you're in bed. If you fall asleep and then it's it's uh, left alone for too long, I think that can heat it up a little bit. I think okay, that can be a cause of, cause of temperature increase, mm. but that's the only thing I've been aware of. What about strong electromagnetic fields outside of MRIs and uh, TSA uh, detectors? What about like walking under high tension lines and stuff like that? The studies have all shown that there's no no influence at all, no effect. Now I have, I mean I. I have spoken to um, this one particular lady I know here who's a DBS for a long time who had a sense when her one of her uh, when one of the IPGs the pulse generators was changed that it was more sensitive to electromagnetic fields but I don't know the certainly the from the you know all of the studies show that it's there's, there's not you know that there is no effect of it on it. I would Again, imagine. I don't know if people individual people have small you know if there is small. Interactions. It's all probably shielded anyway, right? The, the electrodes are shielded as well as the unit itself, I would imagine, be shielded to begin with. The unit is, yeah, the unit is grounded under, um, yeah, it is. It's shielded essentially in a titanium capsule, which behaves like a, a shield. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So that's common really... saying, yeah, some old case reports of issues, but it's sort of small and, yeah, well resolved. All right. Mm. Thank you. Thanks. Gary? Yeah, just, I'm just following some of the comments in the chat and there's um, comments about speech and difficulties with speech that, that can happen. Uh, I'm just wondering, has anybody done the intensive speech and language therapy course called LSVT Loud? Um, I've done it, it's given me Giving me back my voice, my, my ability to kind of control my voice and to be heard and be loud. And it, it really is a dramatic program. It's a very intensive program, and you really have to do voice exercises afterwards to keep going. But it, it really changes your whole mindset when you can interact with people and they can hear you and you can hear them and you can follow the conversation, whether you're in a restaurant or at home, just one on one. It's it's really intensive and really uh, impactful in a positive way program yeah gary i tried it myself i'm much i really i loved it it was made such a difference because i used to even before i was diagnosed with parkinson's even 10 years before i remember i was the one in the restaurant the, the waiters would always have to lean over just to hear me order my food and that's when i was hungry and i wanted the food to have so uh i think yeah it's a very great program. The thing, even after you do it, you have this little person on your shoulder always telling you to turn it up to eight instead of talking yeah. at level five. So, yeah, be loud. You yeah. tune into the cues a little better too. So, people are doing like this. So, I think Madeline, are you going to yes, go ahead? Sorry, I was going to say, I don't know, Gary, if you're hi, Gary. And I, from hi, before, yeah, uh, good to see you. Um, have you come across LSBT Big? anybody yeah. for movement yeah. as well we had a yeah, small brilliant. study on it's, it's that absolutely and brilliant. yeah, it really yeah. Is. the two of them are, are from the same That's organization right. in arizona and it's just uh i mean madeline i i said it to to stephen donnelly i said you should make that Derek air for people who are diagnosed with parkinson's because that's yeah. the first thing that starts to go is, is your voice yeah and you don't realize it and suddenly you're in a, in a kind of a, you're almost in a vacuum because nobody can hear you and you're pissed off and you're 
you're depressed because nobody can hear you, but nobody's ever told you that your voice, you, like, I can hear my voice in my head. So what's what's the problem? So mm -hmm. now I realize, or when I did that course, I realized if I'm shouting in my head, I know everybody can hear me. And that's just one of the things that you keep working on. And it's 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 easy to maintain. Mm -hmm. And it's a really good invention, intervention. And LSVT Big, which is a big physiotherapy and uh, practical physical therapy, is excellent mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. so same, same thing for movements. That is yeah. exaggerating. You, you think you're exaggerating the movement. Yeah. Yeah, to retry, yeah. Kevin, I can just see some of the chat uh, discussion that was talking about speech and the trade-off between things like tremor and speech. And do we have to accept that trade-off? I'm not quite sure we do. I'm not saying you can find a solution, but I wouldn't be so quick to just accept the trade-off. With um, speech, the general consensus is STNDBS doesn't improve speech. And I would beg to differ. If you could listen to me speak now, compared to like three, four, before DBS, my speech has been improved by DBS. There's no doubt about that. Um, and um, and it was just getting the right settings. And that's where the low frequency uh, made a difference for me. The, and I, and by the way, even the term low frequency, the 60 hertz is what worked for me. There's this concept of low and high frequency that you probably heard of, between the DBS settings. 60 hertz worked for me for my speech. 80 hertz was a disaster. 99 hertz was a disaster. 104 hertz wasn't bad. 130 hertz was a disaster. It's not just that you have low and high. It's not, you know, you, you have to tune it to, to the right the right frequency to have the impact. So with 60 hertz, I can speak again. I was about to give up work because of my inability to speak reliably. So I'm yeah, sure I know a lot this. about this probably. I, I, I do want to say that uh, I think just like the impact of lipodopa, uh, the, 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 the drug that many people take, the Cinemet or its variant in your country, it'll improve the speed. It often improves the volume, but not necessarily. But the, the consensus is that maybe it doesn't necessarily improve intelligibility. And I kind of feel like that's kind of when I was reading your case report, Mark, that's kind of where it comes in there. And I think you would expect that it's improving the, the movement related. So if you're, if you're not moving with the same level of amplitude and speed, that's why it's benefiting it. And then unfortunately with the STM placement, you do get the impact of potential programming difficulties I don't think that there's a lot of people, uh, I don't, I, I mean, speaking off the top of my head for the research that I've read that are really highlighting the difference in the frequency. And I think that's a very interesting area of research. I, I did, I did want to ask you, Gary, I had my hand up because did you do your LSVT before you had your DBS or did you do it after? I, I haven't had DBS. I'm not a DBS person. Um, so I had it about eight years ago. Yeah, and um, I was kind of rapidly going downhill at the time. I, I, I was diagnosed in 2009 and like I just put my head in the sand for the next five or six years and I was really in a bad place. Like I was losing weight. I couldn't barely walk um, and my, my voice was really fading. And my wife is a speech and language therapy yeah. therapist, so she was on my case as well. But this course came in, this intensive program came in and the Irish Health Service piloted it for a couple of months and I was very fortunate to, to get into it and it literally changed my whole outlook because uh, nobody could hear me you can imagine the scene you know you're, you're out with your buddies for a drink or whatever for a bit of fun going for a walk with a group of people and people can't hear you and you can't hear them I mean naturally you're just going to part and that's that was really happening but LSVT Loud brought back my voice and I, I keep exercising to keep the, the, the voice strong. And uh, it's it's been utterly transformative. I think so keeping up with the exercise is very, very key. I think it's a big part of it. A a LSVT um, loud is used, used to stand for Lee Silverman Voice Therapy. Lee, Lee Silverman, her family funded it. It was the original yeah. research. It was actually a partnership between the University of Colorado Boulder, where actually where I did my graduate work yeah. and um, in Arizona. But since then, they've made the LSVT big, which is the, uh, the physical therapy components. And then there have been some variants that have come out. So there's a competitor called Speak Out, which is very similar in, in the States. But only LSVT has really uh, done the research. They have four lines of NIH funding. And then they have what's called level one evidence, which means a randomized double-blinded study. And it's very difficult to do a double-blinded study for rehab. 
because you have to have a clinician that doesn't know the intervention. You got to train them in a fake, a sham intervention and then have them do treatment. And that's exactly what they've done three times. So uh, they have really the strongest body of evidence. They're a huge factor of why I, I started working in Parkinson's. I got trained in 07 in Colorado and I said, oh, there's something that we can do here. And then I knew that big was coming out at the same time. So it's a very good program. You should all, you should all consider it or some of the variants, but I, I think they're all great, but I think LSVT really has the research. Yeah, just to finish on that, it really, it really is very impactful, as I said, but it's, it should be, you know, uh, prescribed for people who are, as soon as they're diagnosed with, with Parkinson's, because your voice is fading from the day Parkinson's gets into you, and you need to fight back, and when you do fight back with something like LSVT, it's, it's a great feeling, um, because you're back in the conversation, and it's, it's you know, the, the waiter doesn't have to bend down to listen to you anymore, so it's really good. It, and, and it keeps your it keeps the strength over time. It keeps your communication function. It actually has a little bit of research for swallowing. So this could be a different discussion, but I do agree. And I think the one other thing you're saying that's really important is that you have to find some way to keep the exercise after the fact. And I think that's super valuable. But again, let's get back some of my questions. buddies who had DBS are doing SVT as well, and it's working really well for them. So. My results are better when I see people before I do a little prehab, but I can work with anybody. But I find that if I can catch people before the DBS, there's something in the perception that changes after DBS and it's more difficult, but not impossible. And they have research to support that. So I'm glad you got it early. Heather, I see your yellow hand is up again. I am going to draw attention to the to the chat, but as as I do that, I also want to mention I was recently in the e, in the ER for kidney pain. And if you don't have your meds with you, you are screwed. They don't know anything about Parkinson's in the ER. So they don't know anything about DBS in the ER. So if you do get DBS, take your paperwork with you wherever you go. I guess you have to keep it in your pocket. I mean, I don't even know. These aware and care kits, they don't care about that. They just don't know about Parkinson's. They don't know about our meds on time. And, and if you don't have this with you, your DBS controller, and you're unconscious or something, I mean, you really have to have a way communicate with the hospitals. And I don't know what that is. I'm hoping that maybe Madeline or someone else can speak to that system. They have the Epic system or whatever it is that's universal. Because if I had, been, if I not, had not been conscious and if I, if I had not smuggled my meds in, I was there for nine hours, didn't get offered a glass of water. They didn't have my meds. They gave me Benadryl and they gave me um, whatever it is that kills pain that stops you up and get, makes you constipated. It was a wonderful trip. It's kind of like Disneyland. But just to mention that, but I do want to draw attention to the fact that we're also talking about speech issues that are so important because once you've cut off the speech, you've cut off, you've, you've, you've isolated the patient so much more. I mean, we need that. So I really, I don't want to get these two topics mixed up. But I just want to mention that. So thank you for addressing both. And that goes out to anybody who wants to address it. Yeah. Yeah. And Madeline too, I guess. Thank you for addressing. Always have your medicine with you. I've I was once at a I was in Hong Kong marching with all the people after the the WPC in Kyoto. And I was had my medicine with me, but I had learned to have it in several pockets and not all in one pocket because I pulled my pocket out and all my medicine went flying into like a, a puddle of mud. So I had a hard time getting back to the hotel that evening, but just a little side story. Anyway, I know we're, uh, it was only going to be an hour, but we're having so much fun. We're going overtime. So I'm happy to keep it. We're happy to keep going here if you want. But yeah, if anybody. I think Madeline's got a hand up. The... Yeah, Madeline. Yeah, oh. and we, we might want to respect people's time. I thought it was 90 minutes. I thought we were right on time, guys, but okay. Oh, was it 90 minutes? Okay, it showed up in my calendars. And... I'm the MC. I don't even know this. No. Go for it, Madeline. Okay. Now, it was just a very quick comment on the, the problem of speech and the parameters uh, from talking to our clinical collaborators, the neurologists in the hospital. He says one of his difficulties is that the parameters will be tuned and then, you know, somebody will go home and he'll get a call from them the day a day later or a couple of days later saying I was on my way home in the car a couple of hours later and I noticed there's problems with speech or a couple of days later the speech problems arise. So whether it's that they're not as aware of them or tuned into them in the clinic or just that these are some of the, the features that take longer, you know, to to respond to DBS. Um, it, it's a challenge there. It goes back a little bit to what we were talking about earlier. 
we don't have a solution on it, but I think it's one of the difficulties with it. Just wanted to say on that, I mean, I think that's right, Madeline. I think what I've found is that they could change some of the settings and then all of a sudden it's, a, it's the next day, it's that night or whatever, your speech is starting to deteriorate. Um, but I also think the way we measure speech, I mean, in a clinic environment, I've been asked, you know, they say the days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And that's it. That was the only test of how it's impacting my speech. And of course, dialogue, can you, can you actually string a sentence together? Can you say it? And also not just the actual speech, but the cognitive ability. Are you, are you able to think sharply and speak the way you would normally do? And you can't do that by just repeating simple tasks like the days of the week or something like that. So I do think they don't really, they don't seem to have enough on focus on how you measure speech, given that it's so important. You look at the EPDRS three scores or whatever, I think there's only one question on speech. It, you give yeah. the degree from zero to four and that's it. And obviously there's some more, many more elements of speech. Being able to have a conversation in a, in a meeting like this as opposed to being able to stand up and recite some, something from a piece of paper as about to say the days of the week, all very, very different. And so I really do think that's one weakness with just yeah. how they measure the impact on par Parkinson's is how they measure it on speech, I think. Yeah. And it's so and there, Yeah, there are, and there are good ways to, to quantify speech, changes in speech and speech impairment using signal processing, because essentially it's a signal. So uh -huh. as you say, in the clinic, it's a scoring system. You know, the, this article scores one, two, three, four. But actually, if you have people do sustained vowels or syllable repetition tasks, you can analyze those and get, you know, very good quantitative information on it as well. Well, now I'm thinking maybe we might, we may be, uh, I won't say overstaying our welcome, but we maybe want to wrap it up here a little bit. You hit the head on the, uh, the nail on the head though, the, Dr. Lowry, because I think voice as a biometric is really taking over. Um, and I think the application to DBS seems it's intuitive. I don't know why it hasn't been happening already. John, I don't know if you, we, we want to go to final remarks. Uh, I just want to say special thanks for Dr. Madeleine for coming. Heather, we, we all love you when you're coming. Uh, thanks a lot. Fulvio, if you want to say a few words about the PC of, or, or in Barcelona, or I'll be we're happy to have some words from you. And a special hi to Roy. Uh, you're always a nice face to coming uh, for Huntington. It's always nice to see you and everybody that came along and the team. Mm -hmm. Now, I would like to have some, give some more, some of the voice to Fulvio if he wants to give some words about uh, the Congress in Barcelona. So thanks for coming. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank, uh, hello, everybody. Good good morning, good afternoon, good night, whatever you are, <laughs> which time zone are you, you are. Uh, just I would like to say that we are uh, working with the, the, the local authorities in Barcelona to make Barcelona Parkinson ready for uh, the, the people that are coming to the, to the World Parkinson Congress. We're gonna train the, the policemen, the policemen, the, the people in the transportation services, people at the hotels, at the airport, to know a little bit more about what Parkinson's disease could be challenging for people while, when they're traveling. So this is gonna make Barcelona a little more uh, uh, Parkinson friendly. And uh, as I said in the, in the chat, chat board, when you travel a, a, a abroad, Bring double set of medicine with you. Well, no, don't rely with the with the medicine in the luggage because if it, if you they lost your luggage, you are you are abroad without a prescription. You are you are going to have some some trouble. So bring double medicine with you. One set with yours with yourself in your hand baggage. The other one in the in the in the in the, in the luggage you you checked in. And if you have a, a, a resume or some description for your neurologist. What you are that you are we are Parkinson's, you are using some meds. This could be helpful if you have some misunderstanding at the at the at the at the custom service at the custom where they can check your luggage. You see a lot of a lot of pills that could be strange. So sounds strange for the policeman. Anyway, just uh, we are very happy to to with the uh, what the preparation for the congress is going on in uh, and we are going to wait for you uh, to join us in, the, in the July at the the fourth the fourth for the beginning of the World Parkinson Congress in Barcelona. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fulvio. Uh, so good to see you too. I can't wait to see you in Barcelona. In fact, uh, we highly encourage everybody here to try to get there if you can somehow. Thanks, Kevin, and thanks everyone. Particularly thanks to Madeline for coming along and also Heather. And V wasn't able to make it. V, uh, and Verle um, from uh, Belgium, unfortunately, wasn't able to make it. She 
she messaged me earlier, so I hope she's okay. But um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining.